Richie, do the intro. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our third podcast that we've recorded in a row today. This one is Loki, and he's going to talk about Demon Souls translations. Yay! Is that it? Yay! Okay. Yay! Yay! <laughs> and we just finished talking about the Valley of Defilement <laughs> with uh, Cal, so this will fit in well. Wonderful. I can even talk a bit about the Valley. So, okay, cool. Yeah, it all works out. So I guess we should start with like a little backstory, I suppose, on how I ended up coming on for this one. Um, I was listening to your podcast you guys did for Demon Souls. Like I think it was like the story summary. As you do, you just like have it playing in the background. And Richard had met, well, there's a few there was a few things that stuck out to me, but Richard had said one thing that that sort of lit the fire in my soul. Okay. It was about um, Valorfax. And, like, he was talking about sort of, because obviously Souls has the wonderful um, uh, environmental detail and everything. He was talking about using Valor Facts as an example. And I was like, wait, wait, I remember this being in my notes. I remember having notes on this. And then I, I, I opened up my thing, and I, ha- I hadn't been looking strictly at my Demon, no- uh, Demon Souls notes as a whole in a while. And then when I went back, I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> and I felt I felt a fire lit in me that would probably make Sullivan blush. <laughs> <laughs> and then immediately felt like I had to talk about it. So I did, and now I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Just a blade. <laughs> I'm on fire right now, actually. This Loki's on fire! <laughs> if, you, if you listen closely, you might be able to hear the crackling go... <laughs> well, someone did message us and say that you reminded them of, like, the cadence of a preacher. <laughs> 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 I want to make a joke about that, but I just don't... I can only think of the preacher from Skyrim, so... <laughs> Who's the preacher from Skyrim? The, what was he? He was like, uh, Skyrim belongs to the Nords! <laughs> <laughs> Something like that. Oh, that's how you should do every podcast. <laughs> so if I recall correctly, Richard, you were mentioning that the idea was that Valor Fax sort of, he came out of the tear, told everyone about it, then he went back in, he got captured by, not Mildred, is her name Mildred? Meralda. So Meralda then executes him, and we behind her we see the corpse that is, is supposedly Valor Yeah, because you find a corpse behind her that's got Valor Fax's stuff on it. Yeah. And then Bior says something like, Valor Fax was lost? Yeah. Yeah. So like it's 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 set it's easy to set that way. And I recall when I was doing when I first was making those notes that there was a lot of people that were talking about like inconsistencies and stuff and a, and a bunch of other things about the Valorfax lore. So I'm like, okay, let me see if I can clear this up. And what I found when I was doing um, notes related to Valorfax was that um, he, he's definitely not the corpse because in the open it, it's actually pointed out in uh, it's there's like three major three main Actually, I think it's two main references to Valor Facts as far as um, his state of being. First is, of course, the opening, where it mentions that he leaves the tear, he comes out, and he tells people. And it also mentions that he's drunk on souls in the Japanese version of the opening. Now, this could be figurative, so, like, it could be, like, he's fixated on, he was very fixated on souls, like, he's sort of, like, he's got this obsession toward it. It's not like he literally, like, I don't know, like, drank, like, a, like a soul juice and was like... <laughs> but, um... The idea would be then that, and this is, I think, the way the localization tried to, to word it was something like he spoke of the enticing power of souls. So I think they were trying to get that across. Right. But the idea was basically like he had this rude fixation when he mentions it. Oh, the, it's like, ah, there's there's demons, and oh, yeah, there's this these souls, and they're stockpiling them, and, and presumably he's telling us what the narrator is telling us. Um, and then that sort of goes on. And then, when, of course, we learn that Bjor, then Yurt, and a bunch of others are sort of in order, kind of like over the years, going through this tear. And, and we know how that goes. But it's never mentioned what, what happened to Valor Fax afterwards, strictly. But then we're told the reason why he can't be the corpse, though, is, well, two reasons. But the first is that because when you talk to Ostrava, and Ostrava mentions the whole thing in the localization about him being lost... 
the actual wording is that he died with the legend. So what we're being told is basically, Valorfax left through the tear, he told everyone what happened, and then he died. <laughs> like, it's kind of like... Oh, right. He died with the story. So, it seems like he left already, maybe, let's say he was already mortally wounded or something when he left already. And then he just was managed to tell us in sort of his dying breaths everything that was relevant. And it was like, okay, go have a plot with this, and then died. So, he didn't ever actually go back or anything like that. Right. So, it's already known what happened to Valorfax. The question, of course, is, well, what the fuck happened with Boletaria? So, then you have something like, I think Bjor's the first one mentioned in the list of people that go. And, well, that makes sense. It's kind of his partner. He left his, it's like he left his partner with the king. Then his partner comes out saying all these crazy shit that's happening. And Bjor's like, well, what the hell happened? And his partner dies and he kind of goes in the tear to figure out the details for himself. Um, and then another thing that's noted is that the, the, the armor that the body behind Meralda has, um, that armor only mentions that Bjor has worn it recently. So, like, he's recently taken it, and that's normally a, a, a armor for the royal family. So the corpse is probably related to the royalty, but it's not necessarily Valorfax's equipment. Yeah, that, um, I think that came out of the way they talked about as the twin fangs. So it makes it sound like there's, there's two guys that wear the same stuff. Yeah, so I if think you they're find called the, the yeah the twin yeah, they're fangs called of the, the king. twin blades. I think in the Japanese yeah. version, but yeah, the yeah. same idea that you're talking about. So yeah, the idea so, would be like maybe they'd wear the same thing, and I don't know. Maybe they did. Maybe yeah. they didn't. That was but the like, source of the theory that that's Valifax's stuff. Yeah, because it's not Bjor since he's still alive. Yeah, yeah. But the idea seems to be that Bjor just like took it up recently. Who knows where right. he found it? And then. Um, Valorfax ended up. Everyone seems to know that Valorfax has died. So stuff like that. It's kind of like okay. So th that's a hu that's a huge question in Demon Souls that can be answered definitively just from the text straight up. You don't have to overthink it or anything. So that's kind of the stuff that pisses me off about Souls localizations <laughs> a lot of the time because that type because those are the type of misunderstandings that we can avoid if people do their job. <laughs> Uh, but w we've talked about that before. Um, <laughs> and then, like, another example is on the topic of Ostrava, because Ostrava himself is someone who, who he's well, he was one of the first translation posts I did for Demon Souls, and we could probably link my posts there below, but yeah. um, the general idea was that Ostrava, there's this big talk, you, another thing you had kind of mentioned, Richard, was like everything was like, um, all the areas we visit are like supposed to be part of Boletaria, but they have their own kings and queens or something to that extent. And one of the points that I, I'd like to make is that it seems like they're all their own countries. They just happen to be neighboring right. Boletaria. And one of the reasons I want to point that out is because Ostrava comes from where what is called in localization the like the southern Boletaria. Um and the idea was he came back and he like went he he according to him he visited all these great places um and that they worship Bol like Apolitaria was a paradise on earth to these places he went and he's like okay what could have happened well the the, the Japanese the original script was a little more little just a little tiny different. One, it isn't that he went to southern Boletaria. He went to region south of Boletaria. So oh, he left okay. Boletaria. He was in the southern areas, and these southern regions were far more technologically advanced than, well, everywhere else, basically. So he's all, he was not part of Boletaria, and that wasn't and that wasn't like under Boletaria's control or whatever. So then, and that's why it's not in the fog, and he had to enter another way anyway. Um, then once, he, uh, besides that, then there's the idea that, that sort of, um, these southern regions thought Boletari was so great. And the actual thing is in the script, he talks about how, um, he, he's the one who thinks, oh, Boletari is this wonderful, it's got this warmness to them, it's very, you know, pretty modest, but it's got these powerful warriors. So the idea is basically it's a small communal type of country that still has a lot of military might and he talks about how he's been to really amazing places because these are so technologically advanced these are like the progressive amazing nations that you you could you could never have imagined they're like going through a golden age or whatever but he still thinks he's the one who thinks that boletaria is so great he's like no you know what my homeland it's still better it's just got this 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 homeliness to it that that you know i just i can't like any other country better than it 
So it's not a so it, it's sort of to kind of put into perspective. It's all going through from his pers- through his right. head, yeah. and that's why that's why the it's important that these countries are so advanced because it's kind of showing. It's like, hey, these people they got telescopes, man. <laughs> so it, it's it's supposed to have this mind blowing um, potential, but like Ostrava still thinks, nope, my country's better. Sorry, and it's why it's such a big deal to him that that um, that it's like everything's gone to shit. You have entire characters' lores who get screwed up because of stuff like yeah. this, and it's 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 really obno- obnoxious. Um, another one would be Freck, and this is this is a funny one because with Freck, it's such a small thing, but it completely changes your outlook on his character. So Freck is generally like he's sort of the proto Logan so far as he's the man who sort of he's all into knowledge and, and studying magic and trying to collect all the data for himself, uh, and then. Over the course, he even provides sort of the quote-unquote, I guess, bad ending, where it's like, hey, you know what? Let's not seal the the beast that's going to destroy the world. Let's, you know, keep it, take all the power we can, and then, you know, we can, like, use that power. And he's totally going to just study it and not do anything bad with it, he promises. Um, Not that we'll know, because (laughs) just, don't worry. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Don't worry. Nothing is. If Seath has taught us anything, nothing bad happens from wanting to study things. <laughs> so then, basically, we have this wonderful little character who's who's interesting in and of himself. But there's one line. One line. Let me see if I can find the. If it's it's down with Freck on his his actual his outfit he wears. Let me see if I can find that. Uh, here we go. So here, so it was like, it says, Sage Freck the Visionary's Equipment, a plain traveling suit which makes long marches possible. However, it is the travel wear of a dirty sage. This so sh- Sage Freck's origins quite well. So this is kind of a weird phrase in the localization, because it's like, okay, so it's the travel wear of a dirty sage. So like, is it telling us that he comes from dirt poor? And that's why it's his origin? Like, like, what is it supposed to mean by it's showing his origins and everything? It's like, he's a sage, he wears sage clothes. Okay, so what? Well, the thing was, there was actually someone made a typo. <laughs> and, uh, it, it's kind of a, it, you know, it's just a tiny typo. It's nothing too major. It the in the original, it's it's simple travel clothes that make long expositions possible. But in fact, it's the corrupted or dirty. There's many ways you can put that travel clothes of a saint. So for for I think I've mentioned it before on previous podcasts, but for those who don't know. When I say saint, and generally when when Souls games say saint, they mean a holy person, so someone who's in some ways affiliated with the divine. Yeah, we we literally just talked to uh, yeah. someone about that, about the use of the word saint in Souls. Yeah, yeah. Trippy. Yeah, and it, it's 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 very loose, so you can't think of it like, oh, is there like a? It's not like think of it like I don't know, like lowercase saint, not uppercase yeah. saint necessarily. Yeah, we were talking about it with reference to Astraya, but like. Yeah. You can't view Astraya as a saint in the way that we say saint in yeah. referring to yeah, Catholicism. It's basically because, just, yeah. it's basically in, like in the same way that they use the word cl- cleric or clergyman a lot in souls. It's kind of the same idea. It's just a generic word for someone who's like a, ho- who's related in some way to whatever holy institutions exist. Um, so basically what we're being told is, okay, so the reason why these clothes say a lot um about freck is that freck is wearing the clothes of a holy man meaning he was once a, a holy man like saint urbane um what happened though was those clothes have been dirtied over time as he's traveled and things like that and the idea is that much like how the clothes have dirtied freck's faith has been dirtied and he sort of has become this non-believing uh uh, sort of Wiseman type of character instead. So it's really important because that completely recontextualizes his backstory yeah, and yeah. what he's been through. And it's literally just that, you know, just a tiny little typo. We, and like this, this suddenly puts a lot of what he says and how he thinks because for him, the way he sees obviously God and other things in that and he, he's sort of like, you know, there, the, the, you know, there's only the power and the knowledge and there's not really much to gain from the faith aspects. You, so whatever's happened in his backstory has clearly, clearly hurt him and his ability to have any faith in anything. And so he sort yeah. of becomes fully committed instead to just the reason and the knowledge that he's had. Um, so that that's 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 something that really makes him, a, a, that he really elevates his character even further. And then um, I've done various posts on a few different topics, so I guess we can go through whichever you guys want to 
we can start with Valley of Defilement. We can do like um, Shrine of Storms, like whatever you guys think. We'll do Valley of Defilement because we just recorded for an hour about Valley of Defilement with someone else. So I okay. guess like yeah. they they can make a uh, make a pair. Okay, yeah. perfect. All right, so we'll start with that one. The Valley is probably like that. I did a poll on like on what on what people would want, and of course, I think Valley won like in a landslide. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. You can tell people love that place or love to hate it. <laughs> So the thing with the valley is that there's actually quite a few details about, specifically in relation to Astraya, that don't get cleared up. And we'll talk about the Vinlands, too, since okay, it's cool. kind of all related. But yeah. um, for, for Astraya herself, uh, you, you've met, we've already talked about the saint aspect, so I don't need to go into, into that at all. But there's this interesting thing about her with um, what she's doing. So like one of the things you brought up, Richard, in the story summary podcast was the idea was that you know, she's kind of being a good person, like, she wants, like, to help everyone, but, you know, she's a demon, so you kind of have to kill her, and, like, well, to elaborate on that, the reason why y y we kind of need to kill her <laughs> is just because she's she's kind of a little loony, <laughs> um, just a little bit, because her method, because, okay, so let's take what, let's go through what, like, her character, like, her motivation is, is essentially that she she she's a blue blood she's kind of lived this luxurious wonderful life her entire thing like she's always had the easy route let's say yeah she's never had to deal with much suffering or anything from her background and she's sort of been destined from like ever since she found one of god's revelations to kind of be this this sort of this like holy like most famous holy person so she's kind of never had to deal with suffering in the same way that people of the valley did because you know they've had their entire life living as sort of wanderer nomadic type of people who've sort of been the dregs of society that were abandoned or cast out um and then she sort of sees this and it's kind of like a she's it's like a culture shock to her like like to the maximum degree because she's like holy shit people can suffer <laughs> like how could this be possible not in my not in my christian video game <laughs> So she comes into uh, this sort of realization that, holy shit, what am I, like, if people can suffer like this, like, what is God doing? How could God be allowing this? And so her answer has to be, of course, that God must be evil, because how could God allow suffering in the world? And it's, of course, the common, a common, the common theological question. So then her answer to that is then, okay, let me just make a contract with fucking Satan. That, that'll solve everything, because that, <sighs> that, that could never go wrong. Um, and she decides she'll become an archdemon, and then then she'll be able to finally fix them. So your the immediate question, of course, would be, well, how does she think becoming a demon is going to help everyone? And why she got this entire following? Well, the answer is, is because in one of the archstones, the, I think it's the last one. Let me just double check. So in the English version for the dirty, the demon, the dirty colossus archstone, it's the poor journey to this rotten place to offer... Uh, their souls so that they might be freed from their suffering. So that's a little bit vague, but it's a little bit more clear in the Japanese version where it very, says very explicitly, the needy men that willingly offer their souls there are freed from thoughts that bring pain. So what's ha so as we know, in, in unlike in Dark Souls, which takes the traditional, if you have a soul, you're alive. If you don't have a soul, you're, you, there's nothing there. Um, uh, Demon Souls takes a little bit more interesting approach in that souls are the source of thought and consciousness and sort of your ability to think and reason. So when we take away people's souls in, in Demon Souls, we're not killing them so much. Well, we do kill them when we want to take yeah. the souls, but generally when we talk about stuff like the soul starved, the idea is that unlike, say, hollows, the soul starved are alive even without any souls whatsoever, but they they lose their ability to think. And what Astraya is doing is essentially saying, okay, I've just made a, I now have this power from an, from this, this giant demonic beast, and it tells me that it needs souls. So you bring me souls, and in exchange for that, I will take your soul as well, so, so that way, you don't have to ever have the ability to have consciousness, and you're essentially lobotomized. You don't have to feel, you don't have to think, you can't suffer, you're not able to really be, have any sort of awareness. The intro says, like, Man was granted a soul and with it clarity. And they never really expand on that, but the way you've you've explained it there. That does fill in what exactly what that means. Yeah, and I was wondering how exactly she was like helping people in the valley, what exactly she was doing. And that's cool. So what Australia is giving us is a very seductive idea. She's saying, I can promise that I can relieve you of your suffering. And it's like, oh, oh, I don't have to suffer? No more pain in this life? That is so awesome. I will totally I'm with her. So 
suddenly it's a, everyone's vote for Astraya, and you have the 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 merchant lady who's a little pissy about that. Um, Richard has a theory as to why she's a little pissy about that. <laughs> Well, we, we, she says like um, she calls herself a peddler, and she talks about needing like buy something so I can support my child. Yeah, we were thinking like, well, is Australia that bad, or is she just like, um, is she just basically mad that business dried up? Yeah. Well, it seems like it's a little bit of both because she sort of describes she sort of has this this talk where she talks about how Australia looks down on her or gives her these like these looks. Yeah, haughty looks, yeah. And then she also talks about how she's not happy because Australia uh what's the word uh Australia uh, yeah, like you said took away her business. It's like I was the prettiest one and then she came yeah. around and now everyone loves her. now everyone just pays attention to her. So like there's kind of just a little bit of a grudge there, just a little. Um but it sort of ties into the, but sort of this idea that sort of there's this sort of this this scathing, this ter- these withering yeah. looks that she imagined. It sort of ties into this idea that again, she's she, she sort of has this. Obviously, there's this. Comp- it's the idea that okay, how can so like Dark Demon Souls has this theme of sort of examining malice as they call it, and sort of there's there's these various forms of malice and and the way they do and the way they express themselves and well the way that. A stride, the whole value of defilement seems to do is how, you know, there can't be malice and compassion is sort of the question. So how can anything go wrong because I'm so compassionate about it? I care. That's sort of the, the underlying theme yeah. of it. It's like, I care, how can that be so wrong? And well, the answer is, well, it doesn't really matter how much you care. It matters how much are you actually being helpful or 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 better or do or improvement to to others but Australia lives has lived in sort of this this sort of puritan world where there is no there was no hardship or suffering or anything that could not go her way so sort of like the it's sort of the rea conundrum and sort of you have this naivete um from yeah. this detachment that's being played on and when she finally is actually forced to confront the world's suffering in a very raw form it, it, it's it's too much for her to really handle because she can't really print a process well what re- what like my this this so goes against so against my reality and let's for the sake of uh, for the sake of simplifying let's equate god with reality here if reality is this awful thing you just sort of want to cast it off and reject it it's like oh to hell with reality it's this terrible thing of suffering i i know better than re- than than the world that it is i know what's right and what's doing so and well that that many would say well that's very noble but demon soul seems to also be saying well that's very dangerous as well because you suddenly mm. become become sort of in your compassion, you become captured by your own hubris that you know better than God or better than than the realities of the world. And so instead of trying to accept and work with that reality, you sort of reject it outright and sort of try to cast away and saying, oh, I can't. Oh, I, I know. I know better than this on how it should be. Um and sudden, and 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 that's a very that's a very seductive reasoning, and obviously that's why so many in the valley flocked her. Because hey, what could be so wrong with wanting to get rid of your suffering? Well, you're also going to never be able to enjoy happiness. You're never going to be able to enjoy love. You're you're not going to be able to to hmm. enjoy anything. I don't think there was much happiness in the valley, though. That's true, but the idea I think would be that you could probably maybe get yourself out or be able to. And again, it's not saying that it's not a difficult situation or question. But I think one of the one of the the interesting aspects that that Astraya brings up is sort of she comes up with an answer, but it's kind of a, a terrible answer in and of itself. And that's sort it's like sort of that's it's like okay, you you care a lot and you're really sympathetic in what you're trying to do, but is that the right way to go about it? And all, well, the answer seems to be no. Yeah. Generally, lobotomizing people. I'm not sure if that's gonna if that's gonna win you win you many points. Well, with- listen. If I were <laughs> living in the Valley of Defilement, I'd lobotomize myself, bro. <laughs> Fair enough. You, you you and a bu- you and a bunch of other people that 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 serve her. <laughs> <laughs> um. So you mentioned that Astray is the equivalent of Rhea. In some ways, yes, you can't. Yeah. But then earlier we mentioned that. Uh, oh, what's his name, Richie? I I don't I can't pronounce his name. Egon. I remember it? No. The guy from Demon Souls, her boyfriend. Oh, Garl, uh, Garl Vinland. Yeah, and Garl Vinland is the equivalent of Leroy. So does it mean Leah and Leroy were dating in Dark Souls One? <laughs> I'm sure in some, I'm sure, because we all know time is convoluted, <laughs> I'm sure in some alternate dimensional universe fanfic somewhere, 
<laughs> Leroy comes upon Rhea while she's in there instead of the player, and they, they hit it off just fine. Wait a minute, yeah, because they both go to the catacombs, right? And they're and they're and they're wed, and Nito weds them in yes! in his tomb, and they live happily ever after. We think Leroy is is dating Nito because Leroy defends Nito, like Gal defends yeah, Australia. Yeah, yeah, but looks like there is a twist. <laughs> He's <laughs> Nito m- marries them all. You've been cheating on me this whole time. <laughs> Is that going to be in your manuscript? The the soap (laughs) opera. The soap opera that you never knew about. Oh my god, it's like another Dr. Phil episode. (laughs) Oh god. God. (laughs) Nito, Leroy, and Rhea. (laughs) Just have like Nito in there being like, I worked so hard, I killed 10,000 people a day just to bring food on the table. (laughs) And what does he do? He goes and finds a church lady. He goes and ma- tries to marry his sister. He asks me to be the priest. Oh my God. How cruel can you be? Uh, I like Leroy's just silent through the whole thing. Gosh, this is the stuff writes itself. Yeah. <laughs> So what were we talking about? We were supposed to be talking about Australia and the Valley, but we decided it was more interesting to go Dr. Phil on on the wonderful (laughs) relationships in Dark Souls. And it was. (laughs) Uh, This was a Demon Souls podcast. (laughs) (laughs) uh, Since you mentioned, though, Garl Vinland, though, Sin, that's a good good segue to talk about because... Yes! So my whole thing had a point, yeah. <laughs> yeah we were going somewhere. So so Garl Vinland is 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 kind of a weird like it's not even so much Garl Vinland so much as the Vinlands in general, and I had to rant on Twitter about this one after doing the poll, because this was it was this was a travesty from the fire that was lit in my soul that I had to <laughs> respond to. Uh so the Vinlands are a weird thing in that in the localization they're talked about as both a family and like as a country. Like I think sometimes yeah. they're talked about as a country. They're talked about as though it's a place. Yeah, it's never really consistent, and that's well. To, and part of me says I can understand why the localization is confused because it's kind of vague in some in some areas. Because okay, so let me put it this way. Uh, what like let's take like just let me see if I can find one good example. So the localization go for Garl Vinland's helmet. It goes a dark silver helmet from Vinland. The impressive parietal design. I don't know how to pronounce that. Represents the sacred tree of both houses. Its heaviness slightly impedes stamina regeneration. So this tells us two things. One, Vinland is apparently a place, even though it's used as a surname by the characters. And two, that there's apparently two houses. One house of which will never get expanded upon, and that's because it doesn't exist. <laughs> so. So here's how you can read the, uh, why the localization went here and how you can read it two ways. So you can read that it's the dark silver helmet that's imparted in Vinland, so it's like handed down in Vinland the place. Or it's dark silver helmet that's imparted to Vinland, and you could say, well, Vinland a person, or to Vinlands, as in there's multiple Vinlands because it's a surname. So it's like, okay, well, that's like three different ways you can read it. Um, and they're all valid. So... How is it that we can kind of... So how are we supposed to make it more obvious? Well, the, well, one of the reasons is that some of them... Um, it's obvi- It becomes more obvious that it's about, a fam- it's about a family and not a place because when we go into more detail with other items and things, it sort of becomes more and more clear that, yeah, this is not a place. This is sort of a family called well, the Vinlands. And so I ended up translating as Dark Silver Helmet that's imparted to Vinlands. It's handed down to the, through the family. And one, another reason why this is notable is that... Um, it's not that there are. It's a sacred tree of both houses. The idea is that it's the. It's a symbol of the same family's spirit tree. So it's very obvious that it's supposed to be a family. Now I don't know why this got confused in localization. I I can't go into their heads, but it's 
it's a kind of a weird, weird mistake that that kind of happened because it's very obvious that this is handed down to Vinland's, and that same family symbol that it's handed down through is a a, a god tree, a spirit tree, basically. I don't know, maybe God, like, cried and, like, it became a, a sprout sprout or something. But it, the idea is that this is a tree that's associated with the divine. Um, and that's sort of why it's it's important. It's become sort of their symbol and why they right. seem to have such a big um, history with, like, sort of religious iconography and things like that. Um, and sort of, so the entire idea is that, that Vinland, like... Demon Soul seems to, unlike Dark Souls, Demon Soul seems to have this habit where things are just sort of regions, like beyond the areas we explore, nothing is named. So it's like, like I mentioned before with Ostrava, it's the southern regions, south of Boletaria. It's not part of Boletaria. So it's like sort of just this vague, advanced region south of it. Then you have sort of the giants that are to the north. Well, are there more giant countries? Is it like one big giant country? We don't know. Then you have sort of the vague east, which is just japan like, yeah yeah that's it Satsuki and then and, friends. You and then you have the vague west which is just wherever religious Every, everything stuff. else yeah yeah it's like religious yeah. europe everything yeah so like we're sort of given this idea that unlike in dark souls it's not like there's karim and there's katarina yeah. and all these things we're instead told there's these directions and they have these vague these are their general cultural yeah. traits because the the i can't remember if it's the intro or the monumental or both they say, like, the Archstones hold together the land of Boletaria, which makes it seem like everything involving the Archstones is one, quote-unquote, land. So it's, like, one place. Yeah, I think that's the monumental. Let me just Yeah, check. yeah. So the assumption uh, that, like, I and a lot of people have been working from is that the whole game is set in a kingdom called Boletaria, and the Archstone of the Small King just refers to the palace at the center of it. And then, but then it got confusing because it's like, why does Latria have a queen then? Like, should it not, if it's just a- Because Latria is, at least in English, described as though it's just like the tower of Latria. Like, there's just a tower called Latria somewhere. The way it's put is it seems to be like it- I'm not sure if it's just the tower. And again, I-, I, I For those who don't know, I haven't played the games myself. I've seen playthroughs. I've watched a bit of, a lot on on it, but I haven't played it myself and I haven't explored it. So I don't know if there's like a, a city in the background or something in the Tower there's of Latria area. Forgive me. Okay. So it's basically I don't know just if, a prison. So it might be that that is supposed to be the whole country and it's like it's just like I don't know, you go lower in the tower, maybe that's where everyone lives. But um from what I understand, it seems like they're all their own countries. Like it seems like Boletaria's right. influenced certain areas. Like it seems like cuz you see a city in the distance of Stonefang and you're just exploring yeah. a mine yeah. in and that you, country. Yeah, and like you can see a a village from the Boletarian palace that you never go to. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it, it so it seems like these country so it seems like like these are their own countries and like Boletaria possibly after gaining Soul Arts Boletaria like invaded Stonefang or something and they've taken over the mine or maybe the whole country because we never explore the city we don't know what its state is right yeah um uh and I don't know if th I don't know if they is there any Boletarian enemies in Latria I can't I don't well, think the thing is that there's the evangelists that serve not the evangelists the the uh, fat ministers ah right and. They they're they're like Alant's um call them call them the evangelists because the evangelists yeah. in Dark Souls three are right. a very intentional reference. They're like the king they talk about like when Alant first began to go crazy from soul arts, these um the fat they could just call them the fat the fat officials. Yeah. And they I think I've, I think the Japanese is like ministers and it's basically the same generic idea. So it's like they're just like government workers. They are in they're in Stonefang, and they're in um, they're in some other area where they're like they sort of represent the reach of Alant, mm -hmm. but you don't find them in the valley, the shrine, or yeah, yeah. They're just they're just in um, they're in Boletaria and Stonefang. It's possible that like maybe it's become a vassal, or he's tried to conquer it recently, or something like that. Maybe. Well, the thing about Stonefang is that it's just a mine. So I assumed that Stonefang Tunnel was just a mine in Boletaria. But then at the same time, it's got like, it's called the Archstone of the Burrowing King. Yeah, and it's mentioned yeah. that Stonefang has, that there's the burrowers and that Stonefang is like, it's mentioned as if Stonefang is a country and things like that. Yeah. And that so that's why I'm saying that I think the city is supposed to be like, because 
everything in Dark and everything in Souls seems to be city states. Because make or forbid that Miyazaki create a country with with like three or more cities. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So that 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 was my impression that I got and that it's separate countries. And um, as for the thing you mentioned with the monumental, let's see. So what I have here is. Um, let's see, we, they control, so, like, monumental control, so the same thing with the soul arts, the world was on the verge of destruction by the colorless fog and demons it produced, we somehow led the ancient beast to slumber, however, by then, many souls were lost, and most of the world was followed by the, in the thick fog and vanished, in order to connect what little of the world remained, we entrusted six keystones to dwarf leaders, so for those that don't know, the, the word for dwarf here is the same as pygmies and things like that, yeah, um, Little that, person, the idea basically. is basically small or lesser or yeah. people, and this time it seems like it's being used, I think, figuratively, because yeah. then they go on to explain, and one of the people, one of the dwarf leaders they talk about is the giant. So I'm assuming like they're just trying to say like we were the supreme civilization; these are yeah. the lesser people. And presumably, that's why the Boletarian Archstone is called Archstone of the Small King. Yeah. So the idea. So here is the explanation he puts. He says. Um, to to the ambitious king of a small country, the king of the bur the burrowers that go underground, the intelligent queen of the ivory tower, the chief of the wandering poor, the priest of the shadow men that worship death and storms, and the giants of the north. So I, I guess the giants were like I don't know like an anarchy or something because they don't have a specific leader yes. called out. It's like. <laughs> it's like it's like just it's like to any specific giant no just the giants. <laughs> So it's a bit vague on what they mean when they say connect the world, because it's like they gave it to these countries. It's like, yeah. and then obviously though, there's lo lots of the world. So like, does the world like regrow itself after you reconnect it or something? Like it's never yeah. clarified. But it seems to be all within the same area because it's all consumed by the fog, while the other places are like we're just slowly waiting to for our inevitable annihilation. Aww. <laughs> so, so, Sin's just in the background. Aww. <laughs> 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 uh, and that uh, we who entrusted the key men see uh, us uh, who entrusted the keystone sealed the slumbering beast in this linchpin forbade the soul arts and became human sacrifices for recovering the diffused world as key men ourselves so it seems so from based on that line it sounds like maybe they've been trying to restore the world like they've been sort of holding it together through the linchpin and then they've kind of tried to restore everything from that point onward yeah and sort of maybe that's what's going on there so like we have all the like maybe the north like maybe the the i guess more like the east the west and the south and maybe further north in the giants like stuff has been being recreated or reborn in order to um through the the monumental sort of sacrificing i guess their 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 life energy maybe their souls i don't know how it how how it works specifically yeah and they then, like um oh you haven't played it but you've seen the monumentals right Yes. So like Yeah, it's like they're a, like um they're like meditating monks. Yeah. And they're yeah. they're they're depicted as like small child, so a lot of characters like to call them like in the Japanese yeah. version is at least they like to call them like brats or or, or things yeah. like that in reference to like their the way they look. Um Do you know what those monumentals remind me of? Go on. What? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know that movie with Eddie Murphy? The Golden Child. Yeah. <laughs> I remember mm. one part from that movie that always made me really, really anxious as a child, where he has to, like, he has a glass of water, and then he has to walk on these things, but he can't, like, spill it. Mm -hmm. Every single time, I swear to God, I was like, oh my God, don't spill it. Yeah, that's it. Go on. <laughs> the contribution to the topic. I yeah. just had to say something, so if he remembered I was here. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you see? <laughs> Richie, the true bully of the podcast. <laughs> oh, I see. I see. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, let's see. Richie won sin 50. I'll, 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 I'm keeping score. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Richard. One is w more than 50. Well, uh, yeah, it is. It's closer to equal when you factor in stuff we say when we're not recording. Ah, uh, I see. <laughs> oh, yeah. At least Richie's an honest bully. <laughs> you know that was a, that was some really self-evasing stuff you just said about yourself. <laughs> I know, I know. We have new people watching the podcast because whenever somebody makes a comment like, "Oh my God, this is so mean," poor Richard, help him. 
Like, oh, you're new. You're so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving on from there. So, um, so we've talked about a bit about the valley. So, one last thing about the valley I think I want to mention is that an interesting little detail that was also left out was that, well, there's one thing where, um, I think they just say, like, vague creatures in one of the arch stones, but they're actually specific about the enemies in the Japanese version, and they're the actual right. enemies you'll find. Like, I think so there's, like, some sea creatures or something like there that you'll, you can fight or, or whatever. And then another thing is that the tree thing that, like, is, like there's this giant, like, mess and tangle of brambles and tree like branches that Astraea sits in um when you go and see her yeah and that's actually described as a temple in the japanese thing like this is kind of like their temple for her that oh yeah because they talk about there being an abandoned shrine in the valley yeah. and like yeah. it's weird because that is on the dirty colossus archstone yeah so the idea so was we, that well, this we're is a bit of the like temple. Temple. yeah but because it's on the dirty colossus archstone we were like we don't know what the dirty colossus is is the Dirty uh, Colossus meant to be, like, a shrine that came to life? Because it's basically just a giant hunk of wood. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that most of the bosses in that are just meant to re represent, like, stuff is shitty down here. Yeah, they, they don't really have. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it, there's not really a lot. It, it's kind of like the the spider thing. It's like, it, it's it's just, it's, it's local. It's local. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. You know, just random underground spiders with, like, metal claws. That's normal. <laughs> 